Thanks for coming out. It is a beautiful day in Seattle. I understand that it's gone tomorrow, but anyway, <laughs> it's what it's like to live here. Uh, and um, I've spoken here before, and I just love to speak in places where people have spoken, if you know what I mean. There's a, it's like praying in a place where people have prayed, or meditate where people have meditated. There's something in the building, in the wood, in the fabric of the place, you know, that is different than something uh, new and different. Um, drawdown. Drawdown means that first point in time when greenhouse gases peak and go down on a year-to-year -year basis. That's the definition. How did drawdown start? It started in 2001 when I read the IPCC summary third assessment. And like the ones that preceded it, it was more pessimistic than the one as it, as it follows, they get more pessimistic. And the reason for that isn't so much that things have changed, is that there's less suppression of the data <laughs> because there are consensus reports, but there's no such thing as scientific consensus. Science is evidentiary. It's not about consensus. The consensus was in the Saudi Arabians and the Chinese and the Russians and the Venezuelans suppressing the projections and the science of the, of the fantastic group of people uh, that comprise the IPCC. So I read it, I parsed it, sort of looked at it, mm, we have a big problem. I had found about, I was educated in climate change when I was at Stanford Research Institute in the 70s, the biochemistry, the physics of it. It's pretty straightforward, it's not difficult to understand actually. And, um, and so later in that year, um, uh, I will show you a slide uh, that there was data presented for the solutions and, and everybody was very excited about it. Um, and this is um, what uh, captured my attention at that time. Actually, the first slide I want to show you um, before that is really where we are and where we are is that straight line. And so oftentimes what you hear is language around climate change was about mitigation, about reduction, about stabilization, about net zero. You hear this, this language. Um, well, that dotted line, no human being of any shape, matter, or form, even in a primate form, has existed on that earth when the levels of CO2 were above that dotted line. All right. So anybody who says they know what's going to happen above the dotted line is guessing, it may be an accurate guess, it may be good science, but it is total speculation. We don't know. So in 2001, and even more so now, when people were talking about, and this, could, this was 2001 easily, it's just a little bit higher now in 2017, the point being is that we are so far beyond anything that this species, us, has ever encountered or lived within. And that peak to the left, the first peak to the left right there, that's the Eemian period. It was 125,000 years ago. PPM was 285, okay, in terms of CO2. At that time, there was hippopotami and crocodiles in the Thames River Delta. The sea level was 20 to 30 feet higher in different parts of the ocean. There was crocodiles in, alligators, excuse me, in Alaska, and lions and giraffes romping through Germany. And um, it was a very different climate regime than, and that was 285, we were at 402. So at that time, and especially now, it's really important to name the goal. If you don't name the goal, you're not going to probably hit it. <laughs> if you don't know the goal, if you don't understand the goal, and the goal is drawdown. So when you use words like, not you, but when words are used like mitigation and reduction and slowing down, it's really like Thelma and Louise in slow motion. <laughs> if you're going over a cliff and you slow down, you're going to go over the cliff more slowly, okay? <laughs> but if you're going down the wrong road and you slow down, it's still the wrong road. And so the language around how we should address this problem has been very, as I say, as a, um, what's the word, a weak need. Uh, and not really helpful. Um, somebody said to me, well, Drada, what an ambitious goal. I said, no, I'm not ambitious. You guys are really not, amb you're unambitious. You don't know, you know, it's like this is not ambitious. This is about preserving civilization. This is about creating the conditions in which music, art, right, 
society, culture, knowledge can grow, burge and blossom. Uh, this is for us. This is this perfect Holocene period of climatic stability in which civilization emerged. And now we're supposed to reduce that or stabilize that. There is no stability on that line anywhere. No such thing. So what I saw um, uh, 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 there was this the Carbon Mitigation Initiative from Princeton in 2001, the same year, came out with the famous Global Wedges. These are eight wedges at a billion tons each, if done together, would stabilize emissions by 2050. All right, stabilize, you know, in other words, peak, okay. And I looked at them, and these are the 15 solutions that comprise those eight wedges, and I looked at them in a different way. I looked at them like this, which is, all those are grayed out. Those are solutions that only could be done by large corporations. I mean large conservative corporations, like we're talking about energy and utility and car companies. All 11 of those. And at that time, those solutions were deeply underwater financially. That is to say, if the even more conservative boards of directors of those corporations said, great, let's do it, uh, they would be sued for fiduciary irresponsibility, and these corporations would have lost their balance sheet if they did it. So in other words, huh? In other words, and that's when I started to get concerned. It's like, this is solutions? I don't get it. I don't get it. And furthermore, what can you do? Drive less, you. Uh, put a solar panel on your roof. That's it. What can cities do? Cities are not there. Towns, villages, communities, neighborhoods. Small businesses, farmers, grasslands, forest lands, they weren't there. Really, the people weren't there. This was, this was things, all about things, you know. And um, so I went around at that time, talked to friends at NRDC and Woof Woof and uh, Sierra Club, uh, EDF, and said, we should make a list, we should figure out what it is we can do. What do we, we don't know what we can do, I want to know. I'm just like you. What can I do? What can we do? Let's figure out how to solve this. And they said, yeah, it's a great idea. And so let's figure out the, the carbon impact and what would happen in 30 years. Is drawdown possible? Even possible at all? Maybe it's not. Who knows? And what would it cost? You know? And they said, great idea. We don't have the expertise. I said, well, I don't either. And so I kept asking others to do it, and no one did it, and I, I forgot about it. Okay. And I forgot about it until 2012 when Bill McKibben's piece, Global Warming's Terrifying New Math, came out in Rolling Stone, and Jim Hansen had a piece in the New York Times. And, and I had friends come to me and say, literally, quote, it's game over. It's game over. I tried, I worked hard. It's futile. And my response, or inside, are going, oh, like, oh I'm going to move to the Squamish Valley with my kid. <laughs> I go to British Columbia. Yeah. It's like, as if that was the solution. And <laughs> I thought, well, maybe actually it's the other way around. Maybe it's game on. When there's that level of, frankly, in this case, terror, you know. If you Google the top 10 solutions to global warming or climate change right now, these are two esteemed scientific organizations. These are the top five. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget to put that power strip in your entertainment center. <laughs> it's like, I mean, the, the problem, the solutions that are proffered out there are proverbs. They're not solutions, they're proverbs. It's like, love your mother, good idea. And, and you know, don't forget the power strip. Good idea. And wash it in cold water. And, you know, change the light bulb. You know, and what's happened is the communication around climate change and global warming has been like, well, this is what you can do, and you know, and you go, okay. And, and, and as if it all was on your shoulders, really, you know? I mean, the implication, or that if you didn't do it, then you feel guilty, and you feel bad about yourself. But these are so cute. Uh, <laughs> these are forego fossil fuels. I, I, I try it for 24 hours. <laughs> try it. You can't eat food that was shipped in, you can't, you know, I mean, think about it. And it's very difficult to do. Move closer to work, you know, I mean, it's great. You know, like, you can afford that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I'm moving to downtown Seattle. I'm rich. Okay. So, so this is the book, um, draw down the most comprehensive plan ever, ever proposed. Katie emphasized ever. I like that. Uh, to reverse global warming. Well, let me explain the first part of that title, ever proposed. The reason we can say the most comprehensive plan ever proposed is that no one's ever proposed a plan. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, we had the high ground and we still have it. We could say the most brilliant, literate, nuanced, artistic, whatever we could say, whatever you want on that title, and it'd be true, okay? Um, because there's nothing to compare it with. You know, which is sort of astonishing when you think about it. I'll get back to that. Um, and so, yeah, that's the book. And this is what it looks like conceptually. Um, and it shows that point, that inflection point is drawdown. And that's the goal. We want to inflect. We want to go the other way. Um, and what's affecting our perception around this is how we get the news. And how we get the news is really... And usually in headlines, usually with a sense of threat, of doom, or gloom. Um, not, it may not be true in this room, but and certainly the, the, the greater mass of people in the United States and the world uh, get their news this way. You know, and um, this is, I love this one, this one, uh, because uh, as you can see uh, over here, you know, you have clickbait. You know, a wife smashes husband's head with frog ornament and kept him mummified. <laughs> in layers of sheeting for 18 years. And here's the Tower Bridge, you know, being overtaken by a tsunami, obviously, from rising seas. And they're there as if they were, like, you know, on level of importance. Uh, uh, and here's Lamar Smith, the guy in, from, uh, in Congress who always, you know, says climate change is a conspiracy. Um, this is a good one, too, you know, which is, you know, severe consequences and the real reason that so many women have to spend so much time getting ready. Okay. So, I mean, so when you present information, the science is actually good on this headlines. They're, they're accurate, you know, and 20 things you never, uh, n never knew you could do with Coca-Cola. Actually, they're doing the right thing with Coca-Cola. They're, the, <laughs> they're putting it down the toilet. But, um, uh, and, and this one, the bottom, it says the effects will be felt for 10,000 years, you know, which is a, a game. That's a game over headline if I ever saw one. And that's Peter Bates at Oregon State. It's a very good paper. And the only thing I can say about that paper is obviously he's not a farmer or a gardener. And then, so, draw it out. Who are we? Well, we're not me. Um, we had no money. And I went to foundations and said, we want to do this thing. And they said, well, show us when you get done. You know? <laughs> I said, we kind of need the money now. And they said, well, okay. Oh, anyway. So I borrowed money from my retirement plan and gave money that money had been given to me to write a book by an Italian philanthropist. I gave that, and so we started. But we had no money to hire a, a, a really great staff, and um, a big staff, that is. So we put out the call around the world to uh, academics and students for drawdown fellows, so research fellows. And we were overwhelmed with the most amazing resumes. You know, people, oh, I've won the Aga Khan Award. I'm a White House fellow. I'm a Rhodes Scholar. I'm a this. So they had better resumes at 26 than I have now. And they're just these astonishing people all over the world. And this is who they are. And uh, not all of them, but that's a lot of them. Half, almost half are women, 40%. Half have PhDs. They all have advanced degrees. They're from 22 countries, six continents, and this is the this is drawdown. This is who did the research. And Chris Wright, where are you? He's here. We have a fellow here tonight. Right, right there. He's waving in the back. You can stand up, okay? Yeah. And I felt like if we're going to do this, it has to be a coalition. It has to be a collaboration. It has to be us talking to us, we talking to we, not a white charismatic male vertebrate saying, I've got a plan. We've got one in the White House. I mean, that's the worst thing <laughs> you want is a white male with a plan. So that's just not going to cut it. And so, uh, so we needed you know, men and women with an idea and with a heart and with compassion and with great scientific minds. And we also got 128 advisors. These are some of them. And along with the 128 advisors, we have about 40 outside expert science reviewers. 
And so what we did is just collect all these solutions. We were going to map, map, measure, and model the top 100 solutions to reverse global warming. That was our self-imposed mandate. And so we started gathering them all and going through them, winnowing them, looking, checking, doing back of the napkin stuff. And one by one, we accumulated this list that's in the book. And some of them dropped out when we got deeper into them and we had to add some, but basically it came down to 80 that we modeled and 20 which we call coming attractions. That are so, they're valid scientifically, but there's really not sufficient data in terms of the carbon or the financial impact. We modeled both the carbon impact and the financial. What was the cost? What's the return? What's the net operating savings? What's the lifetime savings, et cetera? So we did both. And on the carbon, we only used peer-reviewed science. Okay. That's the only input we use. Not anecdotal science, not internet science. We use real science. <laughs> and um, and uh, so, it, and we also did it in such a way that we always chose the more conservative number when we had a choice. We always went conservative. And the criticism we got for what you're going to see from our advisors and from our outside scientific experts was, you're too conservative. It's low. It's too low. It's better. It's cheaper. It's, there's more impact. And that's exactly the criticism we wanted. That was on purpose. We want people to say, it's better than that. Not that you egged the pudding or, you know, fluffed it up or anything like that. And so, what do we do? We just do math. That's what we do. And the math has been done on what's going to happen if we don't act, but it has not been done on the top solutions to global warming. And I, it, it, an anthropologist is going to have to figure out why we didn't do that. I, I don't know. I have no explanation. Don't ask me in the Q&A. I don't know. Uh, I spent 16 years, well, counting up to now, 16 years, but 13 years, you know, asking other people, sort of like Diogenes, you know, as we, <laughs> and, and everything, oh, good idea, you know. And, uh, um, yeah, okay. And <laughs> so what you see here, and the first one, is the rank by 2050, and that rank is carbon impact. There's only two things you can do about the atmosphere with respect to global warming. Stop putting greenhouse gases up there, which is conservation, efficiency, or substitution, or sequestration, which is photosynthesis, forest farmlands, grasslands, and bring it back to Earth, bring it back home where it came from. Okay. So this is the measurement in 2050. Um, this is the number of gigatons, which is billion tons, so it's 16.6 .6 billion tons uh, of CO2 that is um, reduced, avoided, or sequestered, depending on the solution. Uh, this is the net cost. The net cost is the cost compared to what you would do if you weren't going to do this. It, would it be combined cycle of gas? Would it be a coal plant, depending on which country, where? And did it, would this cost more or less? In this case, it actually costs less. And then the last figure is over the lifetime to 2050, how much money would it cost? Would you make money or lose money? In this case, you would save $1.02 trillion. Okay. Um, and so we'll just go whizzing through this. This is improved rice production. Rice is a big source of methane. And if you change the production methodology, it costs nothing. You take the water off the paddy in the middle, and let it become aerobic again. It's anaerobic before then and after. And you increase productivity, you get a better yield, you can space your plants farther apart, it actually costs less, you produce more, it produces methane production by 50%. As you can see, the cost is one farmer walking across his field to the next one in teaching. That's it. There's zero cost to, do, to this solution. But it saves a lot of money. Uh, this is uh, offshore wind. Uh, this is not photoshopped. This is in uh, Sheringham Shoal in Norfolk, and it's a triathlete <laughs> going by the Siemens 3 megawatt wind uh, turbines. Um, and I'll get back to wind. wind. Um, uh, coastal wetlands. Uh, this is nuclear. We got criticized from Sierra Club and Greenpeace. You know, how could you put nuclear in that? And, uh, and it's a good question. It's a fair question. We put it in because our mandate was to map measure and modeled the 100 top solutions to global warming. That doesn't mean we're advocates of them. 
doesn't mean that there's not solutions in here that have spillover effects. It doesn't mean there's not solutions here that are re we call regret solutions. Most of them are no regrets, which we should do them no, if there was no climate science whatsoever. We should do them. They have so many benefits in terms of peace and security and health and well-being and jobs. And, but some of them are the other way around, and this is certainly one of them. But the reason we did it is because we had to maintain our objectivity. If we start saying, oh, I don't like this solution, I'm going to leave it out, or this one's a really cool one, I like it, my friends are doing it, then the whole book and all our work would be completely suspect and thrown out. So that's why it's included. I happen to think it's the most ridiculous way people have ever invented to boil water. But, I mean, that's all it does, you know, is boil water. I mean, let's be real, there's no magic to this, it's just, oh. You know, this is um, a rooftop solar. And again, what we try to do with the imagery is to try to uh, uh, open up the, uh, get rid of the cliches around these things. Not a drone shot of Atlanta, you know, suburbs with solar panels and shingled roofs, you know. It's like, how inspiring is that? And um, here is an Uru woman in Lake Titicaca with her two daughters living on a straw island, uh, which will sink if she doesn't replace the straw every three months. And she was using kerosene at night on a straw island. And now she has a solar panel. No wonder she's grinning. Of course. Not only is she safe, but her daughters can read and learn at night. Okay. So I, we wanted to make sure we could look at these solutions in a broader, uh, as a broader canvas, and it, it, not just as inanimate objects, you know, that are sold and have, you know, are renewable uh, uh, as an energy source, but have um, many more implications than that. This is the number 10 solution. This is uh, one of my favorites called Educating Girls. And, and this is, um, I might as well hit this right now, number six, way up there. Uh, you know the drill, I'm sure you do, from uh, Girls Rising here, Vulcan, and, and the girl effect, and so much work has been done in this area, which is what happens if a girl isn't taken out of school in fifth and sixth grade at pu puberty or pre-puberty and married off by her culture or family or for whatever reason. Um, and what happens is she gets to choose to be a woman on her own terms instead of in being imposed upon. And her rate of reproduction goes from five if uh, average and, and higher in certain countries. Um, and if she's allowed to go to 10th, 11th, 12th grade, then she then is a very different person. And the average reproduction rate is two, which is below replacement rate. And she, because of her education, earns more. She puts more resources into her children. Her sons and daughters do the same thing as she did in terms of their family planning. Um, and the, Im the impact is significant. I want to get back to this because it's really important. This is the great bear forest, the Kermode bear. Um, and this is forest protection. It doesn't rank high, you know, because they're there already. So we're not going to make too many new primary forests. But, but you see in the bottom the amount of carbon, CO2 protected, that's actually, you could put in just pure carbon equivalents, 300 billion tons or 196 uh, billion tons of CO2. So it's very, very important. This is rainforest protection and restoration, the number five solution. Um, this is regenerative agriculture. Um, again, uh, very important. And this is managed grazing or AMP grazing or holistic resource management or rotational grazing. There's lots of words for it. And, um, and this is also one, and I want to say this in, in terms of land use, because one of the things you see on the internet is people sort of making very outlandish, even on TED Talks, by the way, right, claims for this and other land use solutions, like we can reverse um, levels of CO2 back to industrial levels in 10 years, you know, it's things like that. And it's giving soil, and the scientists call the soil people, don't know what they're talking about, it's giving it a bad name in a way to make these outlandish claims. And so one of the things we were able to do is take land use, and because you can only model um, something unless there's, we, we couldn't model it unless there was science. <laughs> and, and like there's no science for agroforestry, but there is for tree intercropping, for multi-strata agroforestry, for silvopasture. So we could model those and so it, it ended up breaking up land use into very specific categories and then m measuring them very accurately as opposed to just 
guessing, which we didn't want to do. This is women smallholders. As you may know, 80%, uh, almost 80% of the food in the world is produced by smallholders, small, another name for small farms. Uh, and 43% of those uh, uh, small farms, farmers are women. And the other 20% is big ag, and big ag will have you think that if we don't support them and let them kill our butterflies in our soil and poison us, that somehow we're going to starve. And yet what they produce is corn and soy and palm oil and sugar, mainly, uh, for pigs and cows and trans fats and diabetes. And this is, they don't feed us at all. This idea that somehow they feed us is simply not true. They feed us. This is where, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and so in this case, the, what's the solution? The solution is that she gets the same seeds, tools, and uh, information that men get. That's all it is. And what happens is she produces a lot more food and the impact on forests and so forth is less and nutrition gets better. Um, so, and this is a cool dude in Berlin on his electric bike. He's, I know, he's so cool. <laughs> Nutrient management, which is just a runoff from the fertilizers we don't really need. And um, this one, can you guess what this is? Uh, thank you, yes. Household recycling. This is a um, Dasanak woman in uh, Ethiopia. And they built a bridge across from her village and they put a bar there for the workers. And so the women go across the <laughs> river every day and pick up the bottle caps and SIM cards and things and, and they make these beautiful headdresses. And, and now they sell them to boutiques in France. And they're <laughs> beautiful, beautiful women. This one is a transport solution. I should have more transport, bus, trains, cars, all that sort of stuff. I should put more on here. We don't, this is the one transport solution we do have. And this guy, um, he works at uh, Price Waterhouse Coopers, the former accountant for the Oscars. And, uh, <laughs> and, and he's waving to this guy on the iPad who's got his little mini Segway scooter scooting you know, around the office. He's in Toronto, the guy who's waving. The guy on the iPad is in Prague. And so he can just go to Toronto, log on, and, and then start to scoot around the office and go to call on people. Atten he could come in here and be in the back of the room and, Thing. In the meetings, he could come up to the microphone, <laughs> ask a question. That kind of, kind of, that'd be a little kinky. But you know what I'm saying. Uh, so we're, we're, we're shipping around the world as protoplasm instead of ideas. We want people's ideas. We're shipping this whole big bag of protoplasm. Anyway, so this a solution. So I, we were so surprised when the numbers came out. Uh, we didn't get them until 12 weeks ago. Um, so we prepared the book, designed the book, and had all camera-ready copy or digital-ready copy except the numbers. And we wanted to work on the numbers to the very last second before Penguin yanked it out of our clutches. And uh, um, because they're never going to be right, the numbers. You know, it's just endless, you know. And um, so we, when we got them, we were like, oh my god, we're so surprised. And we had to recheck, and this, and you're sure, and yes, and everything was right. And it was so interesting because um, uh, I had a friend at that time who I've known for years. And when she went to Paris, uh, the COP21, I said, you know, we're working on Drown at a time. And she said, are you going? I said, no, I'm working. You know, I'm going to stay here and work. And um, I said, but I'll make a bet that there's nobody in Paris at COP21, the Conference of the Parties, um, that knows the top 10 solutions. In any order, just write them down. Give any, everybody a piece of paper. I said, I bet no one knows. And I said, well, we don't know. We know that. I'm pretty sure no one else does. Anyway, she called up just when we finished the numbers and said, how are you, how, how, how you doing? Uh, and I said, great, we, we have the numbers. And it's, I said, I, I won't say her name because you know her name, actually. And I said, um, and she's been in climate for 30 years. She's written books. She has been a grantee. She's been... Uh, a grant tour. She, she, she knows climate. I mean, cold. And um, and I said we are so surprised at the top five solutions. I said, you know, I don't think anybody in the world knows the top five solutions to global warming. I'm I'm talking about Al Gore and Jeffrey Sachs and Christiana Figueres and Ban Ki Moon and you name it. I said uh, we didn't know. That's for darn sure. But I don't think anybody knows. You guys, these two guys, but these two guys right here. How old are you? Yeah, I bet you both of them can name the top five teams in the NBA right now. Boom. <laughs> right? 
I mean, come on, you know? I mean, this is not, you know, I mean, yeah, of course. It's like, <laughs> and, and here we're four years into the biggest crisis civilization has ever faced, and there's nobody that can name the top five solutions. I don't know what to say. Anyway, what's surprising us is this. The number three solution is reducing food waste. Didn't see that coming. We can understand, once we saw the numbers, we can work backwards and say, yeah, 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 yeah. It all adds up. It added up. Yep. Uh, number four solution, plant-rich diet. Yeah. Now, this, this doesn't mean vegan or vegetarian, if you, unless you choose to. It's fine. No problem. What it means is reducing the animal intake of protein in Western nations to a level where you actually are healthy. And that's all, <laughs> which is not 80 grams or 100 grams a day. That is not healthy. It doesn't matter where you think you're getting it or what paleo diet you're on. It's not healthy. But it also includes raising the caloric and protein uh, content for people who are, have insufficient nourishment in the world. So we didn't just reduce the West, you know, or you know, the, the, the wealthier countries. We actually increased caloric and protein content in those countries, and it still came out as number four. So, um, uh, so what surprised us is that the food sector is bigger than energy. I, again, like, and again, we looked at them, well, let's look at this carefully, and, and you would think, I mean, what's the solution to global warming? Oh, solar, solar wind, solar wind, EVs, and solar, solar wind, and don't eat so much meat, and then you say, that's it, we have a hall pass to the 22nd century. Not a chance, that's not true. That's just not true. What we've been hearing over and over and over again, uh, yeah, those are critically important solutions. I, they're all important, but I'm just saying the idea that there's just these few things we can do and they're okay, you know? And you just hear it all the time, that mantra. Um, and here's the top 20. But you go, oops, I'll go back, I'm sorry. Um, and yeah, silver pasture, number nine. Again, I had this, the whole thing is, who knew? Who knew? We go say, who knew? <laughs> that was their mantra at Drada. I'm like, who knew? <laughs> you know, but we've done the math rigorously, rigorously. It's been reviewed and re-reviewed and, and studied, and it's on peer-reviewed literature. Uh, and every one of these solutions is scaling. Every one of these solutions is can-do, practical, hands-on, W.W. Granger, they're happening right now. They're not things we could do if only the, all of them were doing them. They're all scaling. We understand them very, very well. Okay, make that very clear. Um, and uh, food is eight of the top 20. Uh, again, okay. Uh, energy is five of the top 20, and you have solar and wind. Uh, now, we, you don't have wind, the, the one you saw, it's 22, but if you add 22 offshore uh, wind and onshore, which is number two, uh, you put them together and they're number one, not refrigerant management, which you saw on the other slide. However, this is the top solution, standalone solution. Uh, which we are actually sort of disappointed to find out. <laughs> not that it is not a great solution. It's just that the HFCs, the gases in refrigeration and, and AC, have a, a, a global warming potential uh, that's thousands of times greater than CO2. So it doesn't take much for these to... Um, and uh, this is well in place. This is one I want you to look at. Here's the Educating Girls again, but look at the next one after it's family planning. That number, 59.6 twice, okay, is 119.2 billion tons of avoided emissions in 2050. That's the real number. We divide, we separated them because the pathway for, in terms of educating a girl versus a family planning clinic for a woman, so she has reproductive choices and support for her health and her children's health are very, very different pathways. They end up in the same thing. There's no bright line between the impact. You can't say, well, this comes from that and this comes from that. So we just divide it evenly right down the middle. Point being, add them both up. The number one solution to reversing global warming is empowering girls and women. Yes. <laughs>
like, again, when's the last time you heard that? <laughs> and as I said recently in Oakland, it's not a panel, it's a woman. <laughs> we need solar panels too, you know. But, um, so remember this was that carbon mitigation initiative. This is what it looks like. This is what it really looks like. This is what the solutions to global warming look like. Look like something you would see in nature, not something you would see uh, from an Excel pie chart. And, um, and uh, so this one is drawn on possible. Uh, this is uh, stoma and guardian cells, stomata. Um, they are in every a leaf and twig in the world, and needle and <laughs> bract. Uh, when you hold a handful of leaves, there's a hundred million of them in your hands. Um, and they are um, the key to drawdown. Uh, when stomata are open, they're releasing their moisture, but also eating CO2 for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And so they have to be open to get that, to make sugars, to survive, to live, to grow, to create, to put that sugar down in the roots, you know. And, and when they're closed, obviously they're safe, okay, but they're also can't be closed all the time because they'll starve. So if a plant always is closed, the stoma is always closed, it'll die. If it's always open, it'll die. <laughs> so obviously stomata do something else, which is they open, close, open, close, open, close. L look out to any landscape, any, any place in the world right here is, is a good one. Look at how many things do you see that are dying in front of you? Not very many. Trees and shrubs and perennials and grasses, they're all living. They're all being made alive by stomata. <laughs> and recently they were computer modeled and, it, and, and they discovered that they seem to have memory about temperature going back many days. They can detect temperature. They can detect humidity. They can hear the dawn chorus of birds. They uh, can detect how much moisture is in their, uh, the plant, the leaves, uh, and the, or the needles or, or the, the trunk, whatever it is. They can detect the moisture in their roots. They can detect the moisture in the soil around them. And with all those calculations, temperature, time of day, everything, they open and close and open and close. Basically, what I'm saying here is that they're friggin' brilliant. <laughs> Unbelievably brilliant. All those plants are alive. They're like doing their thing, you know? Can you imagine if the Republican Party ran <laughs> the plant world? Boom, gone. You know, I mean, it's so, this, this extraordinary intelligence, and, and this is what I uh, hope this uh, works. Um, it does, and this is, you've seen this, I think many of you have seen this as a NASA simulation of carbon emissions. Um, in, the, you know, the orange and the darker the red and the darker red and the vermilion are really um, meant to uh, symbolize concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere. And so what you see here is what happens over a span of a year. And what you see in the northern hemisphere where most people are and for where it's winter, as you can see in the monthly counter and day counter on the bottom, this is winter for, for most of humanity. And what most of humanity does in the winter is try to keep warm and turn the heater on the car and, you know, in their home. And all. we're using a lot of power and we're still working industrially and putting gases up in the atmosphere and making things. Um, and uh, that goes and gets worse and worse and worse. And it peaks uh, in May. Um, and you can, it, the, the CO2 levels peak, but just in May, you start to see these little blue wispy things in the Northern Hemisphere, and then they become stronger and more pronounced. And they keep doing that through June, July, August, September, right? So what's happening there? Well, CO2 is being sequestered by the trees leaving out. You see them beautifully right now in Seattle, um, by the grasses, by crops. Farmers have planted things. Those crops are sequestering CO2. Um, and, you know, you don't see much more in now, right? Okay. The, the fact is that every year we draw down 6 to 7 ppm. Drawdown happens every year. I mean, significantly. So it goes up and it goes down. The earth is breathing. So 
it's not only possible, it's happening. So when we talk about drawdown, we're talking about shifting so we have some equilibrium so that the emissions are not as great as the capacity of the Earth to bring carbon back home on an annual basis. It's not ambitious. It's right in front of us. And what we l learned um, from our uh, research is that we can do it in 30 years with what we know. And so again, on this book, the title, the, the other word, plan, this was written by a Stanford intern. It was the verso for the back of the book. He worked at Penguin. My editor sent it to me, and I said, no, 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 I'm not a plan. You know, <laughs> I've told you that. <laughs> and I left it on my desk, not the cover, but just the verso, the most comprehensive plan ever proposed to reverse global warming. And I looked at it, and I thought, oh, he's right, actually. It is a plan. He saw it. The, 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 where I was hung up is the, the idea that we made a plan, that our staff and our fellows, you know, we didn't make a plan. We found it. it. There is a plan. It's us. We know what to do. We're on the case. We're not numbskulls. We're not stupid, right? We actually care. And we're thinking about our children, the future, this place, this extraordinary home we call Earth, and we're on it. And every one of these solutions is scaling. Every one of these solutions is in place around the world, not in every country, but around the world, and so forth. This is humanity's collective wisdom at work. It didn't come from Paris. It didn't come from a top. It didn't come from some hierarchy. It came from this sort of mysterious way the human beings have of being wise in a collective way they may not understand as an individual. And so that's, uh, this is, uh, she's there in the front part of the book. Uh, why? She's our client. That's what we always, we had a big picture of. Said, that's our client. You know. This is about language. Just briefly, if we're going to do this, we have to change how we talk about it. You know? um, if you use words like negative emissions and decarbonization and you know, G2, EQ, I mean, you're just telling the people you're writing to or talking to that they don't know anything and you do and they really aren't part of the problem and solution. You know? I mean, the, the language around climate science is guaranteed to alienate people who don't know the lingo and the jargon. It's not necessary. You don't have to use it. If you understand something, you can say it in words that everybody can understand. And, and so the other thing about language, and there's many things there, but the other thing about language is stop, we have to stop using the metaphors of war. I mean, combat climate change, fighting climate change, stopping climate change, you know, slashing emissions, you know, the war again. Uh, I mean, because that, that, those, those verbs, you know, are the verbs of dualism. That's the, that's the verb where there's something other out there than you. It's like, it's a not me. So I'm going to fight that thing. It's the enemy. You've got to stop it. Like, well, that's the thinking that caused the problem. <laughs> exactly the thinking that caused the problem. Thinking that there's an ocean we could stick plastic into. There's an atmosphere we can put our carbon uh, into. And so we can't solve it with the same mindset that created it. And furthermore, that mindset alienates and divides. So you take those headlines that we saw before, gloom, threat, doom, all right. And then you take that rhetoric. And then you take the Scientific American and other things like, oh, power strips and, you know, move closer to work and wash in cold water. And you're going, mm, yeah, okay, and so forth. So now you have a little bit of guilt and shame. You mix it all together and stir well. You have indifference, numbness, right, denial, like, I can't, I don't know what to do. You, you, that's not a way to come together. It's just not a way. It's, we know that. And, and so really this book also tries to use a different language to engage you, open it up and go, what's that? When you saw the Uru woman, you look on that page in the book for rooftop solar, there's a picture there of the first solar panel in 1884, put on a rooftop in New York City, made of selenium. And we talk about it in caption and say in 1882 was the first coal-fired electrical generating plant in the United States. And during that time, they started to argue about which would prevail, coal or solar. 
and now we know solar. <laughs> it just took a while, but I mean, so there's stories in there, you know, and there's things. So it's not like read this at your, you know. Oh, by the way, there's polar bears drowning, and there's a big hurricane coming, and the glaciers are calving like crazy. It's true, but it's not a way to enter into the problem of of solving the problem. It's not the way. It's not the way in, and it alienates people. And every second, you receive 11 million pieces of information, your brain, 11, every second. And 40 of them you process, and about six or seven you actually do something about. Okay. So if the constancy of the information is about we're screwed, you're going to get a population that votes for you know who. And this is um, just a quick one just to show, this is a part of the dashboard of a model just part of the dashboard to give some sense of complexity. David Montgomery is coming here. We have essays from um, uh, Pope Francis, from uh, Janine Benews, from Michael Pollan, uh, and David, obviously, and his wife, Anne, um, uh, that are uh, throughout the book. Uh, and they're, they're great, Mark Hertzgaard. And we also have coming attractions, and I'll close with this. Um, and these are solutions that are scientifically valid but there, as I said earlier, there's not economic or, or scientific data to model them. So we don't model them. Or they're so incipient, or they're just above the horizon, just below the horizon. But what it shows is that the 80 solutions we model are not the only tools that we have. It's not our total tool set going for the next 30 years. That humanity is brilliant. It's incredible. And we have 20 of them in this book. We're doing another book called D2. It's called 60 More Coming Attractions. and and these are just, this, we just regale in them at the office, you know, because it's like, God, people are amazing. And this guy, Brian Van Herzen, PhD in physics, and he has a, a Cessna 337, and a glaciologist, a friend of his, said, when you fly over Greenland to Europe every year, would you count the melt ponds? And he did in 2001. He said, well, there's thousands of them. And then and two years later, he was flying over, and he said, well, they're more like melt lakes now, actually. And then two years later, he flew over again. It was like a lake, a really, really big lake. And he got it, how fast the ice sheet was melting. And he invented this. This is big frames made of recycled PET under the water. A, a salt water doesn't break down PET for some reason. And, um, and there's these pumps that... Um, basically are actuated by the rise and fall of the water, and they have these tubes that go down to the thermocline to bring up the cold, nutrient-laden waters below, which are now being stopped by these big heat bubbles, so causing by 97% of the heat from increased warming is going into the ocean, not the land. 97% is going there. And, and so the, the natural circulation is slowing down and stopping. So it brings up the cold, nutrient in water, and you have then phytoplankton, zooplankton, algae, kelp, forage fish, feeder fish. You have the whole ecosystem comes in weeks. It only takes weeks before they did one in Hawaii, and I think six weeks they had a whale shark. <laughs> They're vegetarian. They wanted the kelp, you know. I mean, so he's talking about restoring the productivity of the oceans. 99% of, of, of the marine uh, 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 of the oceans in tropical areas are marine deserts. There's, there's no life at all. Uh, this is hydrogen boron fusion. We're running out of time. You can, it's, um, it's cool, put it that way. They were 17 years in stealth because they know that fusion is where governments dig big holes in the ground and take bulldozers full of money and put it in and bury it. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and the scientists say it's 30 years off, but it's coming, you know. And so. Uh, Dr. Glenn Seaborg was the founder, he's dead now, but, um, and they said 17 years in stealth, uh, they've raised $500 million, just raised $265 million last month, another 265. People who are close to the technology obviously think it's going to work. I say it's 20 months, they have one more milestone to go. I followed them for 11 uh, years as a journalist. I think they have uh, one more milestone to go, which is not the most difficult one. This is baseload power, it's clean. If a reactor goes down, shuts off, you can start it with the Honda generator. <laughs> I mean, it's actually a very cool technology. 
This is repopulating the mammoth steppe, it, and it's really about bringing animals back to the subarctic circle. We wipe them out as hunters, the Clovis people and others. And what happens is when there's grass there and there's ruminants and, you know, Yakutian horses and elk and muskox and reindeer, in the winter they brush away the snow to get at the dead browse to eat, you know, when it's, you know, dark and everything. And the temperature of the soil goes down two degrees centigrade, which protects the methyl hydrates in the permafrost. And so it's a permafrost protection solution. It's just brilliant. Uh, they already have a Pleistocene park. This is building with wood. Um, and the, the highest uh, building, a, a, a wood building now is going up the uh, CLT building, Beneficial Bank in Portland. It's 12 stories. Um, and these buildings are more fireproof than steel and concrete buildings. I know, it's counterintuitive. <laughs> big, big impact. This is the last one. I named this one. Uh, it could be called the cow butt solution too, but uh, it's, you know, remember the joke, a panda bear walks into a bar. You know, this is a cow walks onto a beach. And what it is, a farmer in Prince Edward Island, Joe Dorgan, uh, noticed that the farm, he's a dairy farm, and most farms in <laughs> Prince Edward, Edward Island are near the ocean, actually, when you think about it. But he noticed that the, the cows are eating seaweed produce more milk. And so he, he asked a local friend, he said, oh, you should talk to this scientist. And, why? You know, he's like, what's going on? He said, well, because methane production is, you know, so uh, uh, inefficient, and so therefore it's suppressing methane production. Uh, and so they did an experiment where they fed lots of seaweed to a few of the dairy cows, and they put plastic bags on their head and, you know, measured the emissions and poor cows, but uh, it's for science. And, and, uh, and, um, and sure enough, it worked, but they had a, you know, a, lot of, a lot of kelp, you know, and it was impractical, expensive, but instructive. And so the scientists heard about somebody in Queensland who was doing the same work, and they got together. He went down to Queensland, and they just tried to find something that would mimic what the, uh, the kelp was doing in the seaweed, and they found something called Asparagopsis taxiformis, which native Hawaiians eat. Uh, it's delicious, actually. And if you feed it in a 2% level, into sheep or goats or cows or cattle, uh, methane production is reduced 70 to 90 percent. You know, and, and it's so cool and how it was discovered. So remember the marine permaculture guy, you know, the guy who's going to put these frames under the water and grow. Those two are working together and raising money to grow Asparagopsis taxiformis on marine permaculture. And what marine permaculture does is because kelp sequesters carbon faster than any plant above or below, I mean, that's number one, is that you deacidify the oceans. That was, uh, yeah. uh, and you produce protein because you produce fish, right? And so, um, and lastly, uh, is there a business case? I love that question. I don't get it from you, but I do get it from business people. And I, I say, wow, business case. I'll tell you the business case for this. You could tell me the business case for double glazing the planet, destroying the oceans, and clear cutting a tropical forest, and you know, poisoning uh, everything else in between. You know, in other words, this question itself is so interesting because it sort of implies that the business is just about money. You know, but it turns out that when we added the numbers, I said 12 weeks ago, we hit the total button, uh, we have to make sure we don't double count, and system dynamics is a complex model, and it turns out that if we institute these solutions over the next 30 years, we'll save 20, uh, $78 trillion. <laughs> save money. In other words, what's the cost? The cost is zero. It's not, there's no cost at all. Um, and I want to just read you uh, just an excerpt from one of our... Um, one of our greatest uh, U.S. scientists, um, uh, Matt Damon. Um, <laughs> spoiler alert, he did come back from Mars, okay? I mean, um, so, but remember at the end of the movie, if you saw it, I mean, he was the wise, you know, uh, elder, so to speak, and he was, went to a class of newbie astronauts, you know, and, and he was asked to address them, and he, this is what he says, so pay attention because this could save your life. He says, when I was up there, did I think I was going to die? And he said, yes, absolutely. Right. And that's what you need to know going in, because it's absolutely going to happen to you. This is space, 
it does not cooperate. This is atmosphere. <laughs> it doesn't care what we think. It doesn't cooperate. All right? Uh, he didn't say that. I'm saying that. <laughs> At some point, everything is going to go south on you. Everything in you are going to say, this is how it's all going to end. So, now, he said, you can either accept that or you can go to work. That's all it is. You just begin and you do the math. <laughs> I love that part. You do the math. <laughs> you solve one problem and you solve another and you solve the next one and the next one. And if you solve enough problems, you get to go home. And that's what this is about. Let's go home. Let's not waste a minute thinking that we can't do it or that's impossible or that somebody else is going to do it for us, you know, or that we need somebody at the White House who understands it. We would like that, but we do not need it to act, to support, to enlist, to engage, to implement these and many other solutions. Remember the pie chart the, the, where it showed all those little tiny solutions? You know, the little tiny ones? You couldn't, little tiny little, it, there was no names on them so tiny, right? Note that in order to achieve drawdown, you need those as much as you need the big ones. So this idea we should focus on the big ones, oh yeah, for sure. There is no small solution. That's what I'm trying to say. Is there small people? Is there a lesser species? Is there a lesser star? Is there a less, I mean, just that thinking is the thinking that got us, all oh, let's focus on the big ones, solar wind, solar wind, you know, it's like all of them together. And the ones that seem marginal and small are extremely important. So it's a matter of like, do you resonate with it? Yeah, I resonate. Well, then do it. Help it. Figure it out. And somebody's asked like, whoa, how does this relate to politics? I said, I don't know. We'll see. But we do know one thing, and, and that is that the Commonwealth of Nations, 52 nations, the former British Commonwealth, the Secretary General, the Honorable Baroness Patricia Janet Scotland, the former Attorney General of the UK, uh, from Dominica, a force of nature, unbelievable one, unbelievable, has adopted Drawdown as the template to reverse global warming and, 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 and to institute economic and ecological regeneration for all 52 nations in the Commonwealth. And that's almost one-third of humanity and one-fourth of landmass. She saw the book early on PDF form and said, let's go. And that is for real. And that's happening. And the research we're doing from now on will be presented. So, so I just want to say we can do this. And, and, and so, and, you know, there's two ways to look at it. it, it you know, global warming and climate change is happening to you. Oh, dang. <laughs> That's unfair. They did it. I wasn't involved with that. I didn't make the decision. You know, I mean, let's sue them. Uh, uh, you know, they're bad people and, and I'm really upset about it and I'm a victim, obviously, you know. I mean, the two preposition is a dangerous preposition, is what I'm saying. The preposition is for, it's happening for you. This is happening for us. This is a gift. This is an offering. This is feedback from the only home we know, which is planet Earth, and it's the feedback from the atmosphere, and it's begging us to transform everything we do and reimagine it to make a far kinder, more generous, compassionate, beautiful, productive world than the one we have today. And that's what this is about. Thank you so much.
All right, good evening everyone. My name is Allison. I'm a house manager here at Town Hall. We have time for questions now. We have about 10 or 15 minutes, so if you can, um, just keep your questions brief and in the form of a question so that we can get through as many as possible. Thank you. I guess I'm first. Hi. Uh, thank you for the work you're doing. It's really uplifting in a way that few climate change talks I've been to have been, so uh, thank you for that. Um, I really appreciated your focus on the use of language that doesn't polarize, and I'm curious, um, Seattle, we're preaching to the choir, I think we're on board with this, and we all voted for not the other guy, and if you were in Dallas and you wanted to excite people to the opportunity of addressing this, how would your talk be different and what kind of, um, what kind of suggestions do you have for that and the kind of organizations that are addressing, working with people across the aisle to address this work? Thanks. That's an interesting question. I wouldn't change it much at all, actually. Um, the, uh, uh, gosh, I, I think I might show this. Thank you so much, Jason. I, I don't know if I should show this video or not. Uh, maybe I will as an answer to the question. This video um, was, um, it's from Interface, right? And, and the, C, the new CEO um, came in two years ago, and I've been working with it for years and years, Ray Anderson's company, the leader in sustainable development, and they had a 20-year goal of zero. That was mission zero, and they're 91% there in terms of fossil fuels and waste. So, so they're, they're there, and they need a new 20-year goal starting in 2020. Ray Anderson passed away five years ago, and then the CFO became CEO, but then they found somebody named Jay Gould, and, and, and Jay uh, was, uh, is, I guess, I don't know, was or is, but he was a Republican. He was a, a Republican and a, a big supporter. Uh, and uh, and, I, and I, he'd, I heard he didn't really want to meet us. We had the, the Janine Benyus and myself, and we're the, you know, the, the green part, the greenies, you know, and we were a little concerned about meeting him as well. And, uh, um, you know, this, this is being filmed for, I can't show this if it's on CNN. That's a problem. That's why I didn't show it. I don't know what to do about that. Do it. Wait, but can you, can you turn it off? <laughs> no, I mean, the reason, I mean, not CNN, but uh, C-SPAN. The reason is because uh, of licensing uh, problems, not because I don't want you to see it. Thank you very much. A brief intermission. So can you stop? Thank Are you off now? No. No? What? No. I want to do it now. It's my, it's my presentation. What? You can't start and stop? OK, then I can't answer your question the way I want to. But um, I'll show it to you afterwards, OK, and so forth. But the point being, is that what we did then, and I can set it up, is we're just ourselves. You know, each one of us talked about what we're doing, who we work with, which government, which, you know, which corporation, and so forth. And it just sort of softened him in such a way and really impressed him in a sense of the breadth and the scope of what all these people were, how they're reaching out to the world and, and the influence and the impact that they were having. Um, and so let's watch that uh, when the camera goes off. But I want you to know, when you see it, he chose the music, he wrote it, um, he created it, and, you, and, and that's Dallas in, in that sense. And he would say the same. He tweets me now and saying, well, who is this guy at the EPA? He doesn't get climate science and so forth. <laughs> yeah, and so forth. I mean, and so I just have a very strong faith in people that if you create the spaciousness for people, they can come into this, you know. But if you're right, you know, uh, then you're making other people wrong. And we don't say we're right. In fact, we say in the book, every, we're, no, nothing in this book is right, because it's about the future. And eventually the models will be available, so you can do it yourself. And the methodology is all transparent, it's all open. It's like it's us, again, talking to us saying, what do we know? Well, this is the best shot so far, best ever proposed, because, you know, it's the first one. And I hope somebody beats us and does it better. But this is what we need, you know, in Dallas, just as much as here. Yes. I'm sorry, you're next. Thank you. 
These solutions are all technological, scientific, quant quantifiable. But we can also imagine a pie chart of qualitative reduction of sexism, reduction, uh, increase in social justice, reduction of, of belief that the world's going to end soon, reduction of live for today's solipsism, don't care about the future. Yeah. How do we fold those in with the measurable, quantifiable, technological solutions? It's a really, I mean, it's a really good question. And like people ask us also, you know, why isn't carbon pricing or cap and trade a, a solution? And well, that's, that's the policy. It, it actually enables every solution. It accelerates every solution. The, one of the most interesting solutions that's not there is, is, is peace. No, seriously. I mean, what it takes to support the standing military, whether it's standing or inaction around the world, is staggering. And the impact is staggering. And you go all the way out and measure, too, the trauma and the health impacts and the, the long-term impacts of, you know, the, you know lead and, I mean, in the, in, from bullets. I mean, it goes on and on and on and on, and we couldn't measure it, you know. There are things here that are our behavior. Plant rich diet is behavior. Actually, food, reducing food waste is both behavior and cold chains and technologies. That's both together. Educating girls, that's behavior. Now, in this case, it's behavior that we think is natural and is being, in a sense, suppressed or being not, not allowed people to behave the way they would otherwise and so forth. So there are behavioral solutions in here. But yes, we wanted to produce something that was measurably accurate. And if we couldn't measure it, it doesn't mean it's not important. It doesn't mean it's not germane. I mean, the most important thing we can change is actually our thinking. That's the number one solution, is our minds. Because, you know, like Byron Katie says, you know, your, your, your thoughts, it's a dangerous neighborhood, don't go there alone, you know. I mean, um, you know, because the way we, way we see the world is what we think, you know, and, and, and then we project that out into the world itself. And that's, a, that's what sexism, I mean, those things you're talking about, those qualities or lack of qualities really come from our minds, you know. And, and so each of us as an individual has a, a responsibility to, to attend to our minds, you know, in whatever practice or way, whether it's prayer or meditation or, or song, you know, there's so many ways to do that. Um, um, but anyway, thank you so much for, for that point. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Hawkins. I really look forward to reading your book, um, but I foresee one problem with it already, and that is it's a book and our acting president will never read it. <laughs> I'm wondering, would you mind if I take a few pages a week and reduce it to four to five minutes of presidential palbum that he can easily digest? Um, I'll even wear a MAGA cap if I have to. So I was just wondering if you could. You can do whatever you want. If, if, if I don't know, if the publisher doesn't know about it okay. because it is copyrighted, so you can do it and then you know, that thing about government agencies, better to ask for forgiveness than permission, you know. And, um, I'll have your book in the background. Yeah, so whatever. It will know be fine, yeah. Do read. Yeah. But I do want to say, we did a, you, this is in, a, you know, books don't sell. They do sell. But, a, you know, a lot of people approached us. Okay, this is the third day the book is out, right? Last night was the uh, second emergency printing. 10,000 copies. There's, there's, there's 40,000 copies in print. And Penguin's going, what the? I mean, um, this is a second emergency printing. They're like, oh my gosh. And they had to print it quickly because they're running out of books. Um, so I think the reason for that, though, and I agree with you, it's a book, you know, with all the limitations therein. But I think what's happening, I'm not sure, because how would I know? But I think people are buying it, looking at it, and then buying a bunch of them, and giving them to other people. And I don't know all of you, how often do you buy a book and give it to others? I'm a reader, I love books. I often tell people, gee, did you read this? Did you read this? Oh, it's a wonderful book. Every so often, I read a book, like Andrea Wolf's book, The Invention of Nature, and I go, oh. Oh man, I buy it and I give it to all my friends, you know, and because you should really read this and I'm going to make you guilty if you don't, you know, 
And um, so I think that's what's happening with this book. And, and people are so relieved that there's something where they can engage in with respect to the climate and global warming that doesn't bum somebody out, you know, that opens up their heart and their idea and their imagination. But it stands, I don't know. That's just a theory. But anyway, yeah, thank you. Oh, we have time left for just these last two questions. Okay. Uh, thank you for being here. Yeah. Uh, I'm not, I don't need a mic. I got a pretty loud voice as it is. Can you all hear me back there? Please, 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 please. What? I'll use please, the mic. Please, please. Uh, testing, hello? And don't, you can, Does it work? I don't know with your voice. I can't right. tell. <laughs> but, uh, I, I, uh, my name is Andre Turner. I uh, was Cascadia College. It's working. Uh, up in Bothell. And uh, we're some students down here. And I had to read your book along with another fellow student, Chelsea. And we did, you know, the National Capitalism was really quite interesting. And something I keep seeing is about communication, which I feel is key to this whole issue. I keep seeing three, we need to get to 350, we need to get to 330, we need to bring down to 280, pre-industrial age. What makes the 280 or the 350 the key point? Does it deal with like feedback loops or is it just a pipe, yeah. a pipe dream or? No, it, the, those numbers are the high numbers of the Holocene. So the Holocene period is the last 10,000 years. Right. It's interesting, I'll, I'll, I'll go to a circle into that thing. Usually, when, oftentimes I used to go, when I went to an audience, uh, the first question I'd ask is how many people here don't believe in global warming and climate science? And nobody would raise their hand. I said, no, it's okay, it's okay. You don't feel free, don't worry. You know, nobody would raise their hand. And then I said, it's a trick question. Everybody should have raised their hand because it's not about belief. Right. Okay, and the people, and that's a Karl Rove question that was planted by the Republicans to make people who understood the science and were concerned about it to look like true believers. And the Republicans look like sane, objective, you know, judicious people. We're not believers, we are, you know. And so the believers, though, are those people because what they believe is that the climatic, relative climatic stability it produced civilization as we know it, the Holocene period, the last 10,000 years, is going to continue to persist for centuries ahead. There's not one shred of data to support that belief. So they're the true believers, not us. And uh, we're the skeptics. And we're skeptical that there's anything that supports those views. Uh, and so that's the 280. That's, as you saw in that first chart, 285 was the high in the last, uh, 125,000 years, and it came back up there starting in the 1800s, you know, and then went past it uh, in, in, in the 20th century, and then etc. So I think what Jim Hansen and others are saying when they talk 350, 300, 280, I mean, they're saying the, the absolute maximum, you know, that might be tolerable and not completely so everything a kilter. I, but that's science. But I don't think, as I said, there's no real science to support that contention unless you get back under the, the... What we do know is that once you have drawdown, there's a 20-year lag before you get cooling. In other words, it's got momentum, you know, and so forth. So even if we do achieve drawdown in 2045 or 2050, it's not until 2065 or 70 where we actually start to get cooling. So we're in for a really interesting ride. Yeah, thank you. And there's thank one you. more question. Thank you. Um, my name is Kathy Wyshenko. I've been working in climate for a long time, and I want to echo just how wonderful it is to have a resource that is so solutions focused because it has, it's a tough field to be in, and so many people, um, I think, have disengaged because of the, the sense of lack of, of hope and solutions. Um, I'm curious, along those lines, um, if you've thought about ways um, highlighting all these solutions, are there mechanisms for the average person to somehow, beyond individual things, like I can affect my, my diet, I can make it more plant-based, but it's a little hard for me as someone living in Seattle to affect the marine permaculture or silvopasture. Is there, are there mechanisms for individuals that have some capacity to do, to financially contribute or something? Are, are there ways that you can highlight those on your website so that there are, there are ways that people can help create these, you know? It's a good question, yeah. The website is a work in progress. Uh, it's up there, the solutions up there, the numbers are there, the rankings there. 
Um, and then the notes are up now. There's about 2,000 notes and about 3,000 references that go into the content, about 5,000 references for the content, uh, and they're going up. Then what goes up is the methodology. You say, well, how did they figure that one out? You know, what, what, was their, you know, what was the methodology in terms of inputs? So that's going to go up. And then there's two mm, things what's called a, uh, educate and activate. And educate, I want to know more about this. And then we're going to point to NGOs or institutions or, or literature or websites that will, or movies or documentaries or whatever it is that will uh, uh, help a person learn more about that solution. Activate is you want to do something about it. Here are the people, organizations, institutions, companies in some cases uh, uh, that uh, are active in this area. Um, and so exactly so that people can go there and then you know, determine what it is that they want to do um, or, or how they make a contribution. The most important thing, I think, is for people to look at it and see where they resonate. Resonate and um, like, oh, this really, you know, I, I really, this makes sense to me or my heart starts going pit a pat, whatever. I mean, and then that's an area where they can be effective, you know. And um, so it depends on each person. I know everybody says, what's the call to action? What's the call to action? And, you know, I don't know. People say, what should I do? And I think, I have no idea what you should do. <laughs> and if I answer that question, you should run, you know. It's like, that's a Wizard of Oz question. And it's like, it's, it's you, you figure out what you should do. You know that. I don't know that. And, and what I can do is provide the information, the basis that will help expand the sense of possibility and choices for you, you know, if you want it. If you don't, that's fine too. And what I say in the book is, another thing is, we're, we, we, we are all innocent. All innocent. And then when we know something, then we make a choice. That's all there is to it. And, and we just can't see each other in any other way, you know, because it takes away from who we are when we see somebody in a way that's lesser than that. And we, when we do that to ourselves, it's not fun. This is a short life, let's stay here, let's have fun. We're granted the most incredible opportunity that any generation, set of generations has ever had, you know, and it's all about reimagination. So I want to thank you. Don't go away because when the camera is going to turn on, <laughs> so don't, don't stand up and go and say, C-SPAN, thank you so much, and, <laughs> and thank you. Let's take out. <laughs>